In 1998, VM Labs was trying to make an impact in the video game industry with a mysterious new console known as Project X, which had been in development since 1996. The hype for Project X was big. Many said that it would be the successor to the Atari Jaguar. VM Labs was founded by Richard Miller, and Miller previously worked at Atari on the Jaguar. Like most of us, Miller agreed that the Jaguar failed because it struggled to get mainstream developers to support it. The Jaguar was doomed almost as quickly as it was released. Around the same time, DVD players were becoming very popular in the home, and at VM Labs, Miller had a clean slate to learn from the mistakes of the Jaguar. His idea was to implement game console technology inside of DVD players and license the hardware to manufacturers like Samsung, Hitachi and Toshiba in exchange for a cut of the profits, and of course, games and peripheral sales. But this idea isn't new. The Panasonic 3DO went down a similar path, and although the hardware was good, the 3DO never captured the market either, and failed. But Project X seemed to be different. Surely it was going to work this time. More details emerged, and many of the first games announced were updates to Atari Jaguar games, with legendary developer Jeff Minter on board announcing Tempest 3000 and the Virtual Light Machine 2. Other games such as Iron Soldier 3, and of course, Doom was announced. To add to this, developers on the Project X said the system was easy to port games to from the PlayStation 1, Dreamcast and PC. The hardware was said to be powerful enough to even play Quake and Quake 2, killer apps for any system at the time. In October of 1998, the Project X hardware got its official name, Nuon, but by 2000, the hype was all but dead. History will tell us that the Nuon was a failure perhaps due to the confusion as to what it actually was, or maybe it just shipped too late. Some thought it was a game console, while others thought it was a set-top box device, which was partly true. And for years, it was considered vaporware before appearing in 2000. And at the time, it had to compete with the PlayStation 2 and Sega Dreamcast. Essentially, new one was technology to play 3D video games on consumer DVD players, and there were a total of eight DVD players to support it, you could tell if your player had Nuon technology by the logo on the front of the player. Miller's idea to put game system hardware inside of a home DVD player was a smart one. So smart, in fact, that Sony ended up taking that idea and flipping the script. Initially, the Sony PlayStation 2 was a games console only, but Ken Kudaragi, Sony PlayStation chief architect, demanded DVD playback be added to the hardware. And although Sony's entertainment division protested the move, it turned out to be the right one with the Sony PlayStation 2 becoming the highest selling console in history. New one enabled DVD players started appearing in North America in early 2000 and they were barely distinguishable other than the logo. By 2003 it was all over. Sony, Nintendo and Microsoft were at war. There was no room for a fourth player. VM Labs sold to Genesis Microchip in 2002 and by the end of 2003 there would be no more new one hardware. Most people have never even heard of the name Project X or Nuon unless you got caught up in the E3 hype of 1998. And who could blame them? There was only a total of eight games ever released for the system. But one reason to get excited was Jeff Minter was on board with Tempest 3000, which was a direct sequel to Tempest 2000 on the Atari Jaguar. One of Jeff Minter's good friends was Tony Takushi, games journalist in the 80s who later worked at Sega in the early 90s as European product manager. Tony was a fan of Pilot Wings on the Nintendo 64 and had an idea for a game. He wrote up a design document and mentioned it to his good friend Jeff Minter, who spoke to VM Labs. The pitch was for a game set in the future. A cop who free falls from the sky and takes out criminals on the way down through fully 3D texture map stages, awesome full motion video cutscenes, and thumping techno music. VM Labs greenlit the project. Takushi labeled the game as a mix of Quake meets Pilot Wings. Known as Freefall 3050 AD, it was released in the year 2000. And make no mistake, this is old school gaming right here. Hard as nails, great music, long cheesy cutscenes and a bad tutorial. At its core, Freefall 3050 AD is an on-rail shooter. The controls will take some getting used to. As your character free falls to the ground, he will need to take out enemies all while avoiding traps. Some of the levels are designed more as puzzles. You'll need to navigate through areas without dying, while some levels are pure arcade shooting. 
Speaking of death, it's going to happen a lot. The 3D freefall sequences look great, but the game is probably a little too hardcore for the new one. Remember, this is a game system baked into a home entertainment DVD player. Something like this was better suited for the Xbox or PlayStation. At the time of release, reviews were generally positive. Game fans review gave it a very respectable 80% and the game went on to sell around 10,000 copies. Fast forwarding to modern day, Freefall 3050 AD was released for the PC on Steam. It's cheap at $2.99. It's dated somewhat, only supporting two 4x3 aspect resolutions, but supports X input controllers and retains the same feeling of the original Nuon version, and of course runs at 60 frames per second. In my opinion, it's worth a pickup. So, you're probably wondering, why do I care so much about a game that no one ever played on a system that no one had ever heard of. You guys know I love my homebrew development and I love the Xbox. And there was indeed an unreleased version of 3.4 3050 AD developed for the original Xbox that was never released. I had read stories and interviews that Total Arcade Software, Tony Takushi's company, had worked on an original Xbox port of 3.4 3050 AD that was never released. I'd reached out to Tony, introduced myself and told him about my background. I'd asked Tony if he'd be interested in having me finish off the game for him and release it for all the fans of the original Xbox to enjoy, for free of course. Tony liked my idea and sent over the source code for me to take a look at. That port was said to be about 95% completed, but was never released. So 15 years later, this is the part where I step in. Finishing off this port was a very fun exercise. Initially, I wasn't sure how complete this game was. As a developer, when someone tells you it's 95% complete, we sometimes know better. But there's one thing I do know, and that's the Xbox, and with my trusty debug kit, I figured I could knock this out no matter how bad it could be. The good news is it actually was around 95% complete. All the code and assets were there, but it initially had around 300 compiler errors, which took me around 4-6 to six hours to fix. But to my surprise, the game loaded to the title screen just fine. So I launched the first level and played through the game, testing the controls, and it was running great, and it felt good on the old Duke. So are we done then? Let's button her up and put a bow on it? Well, not quite. Things aren't always that simple, are they? First of all, none of the cutscenes were working, a big part of the game, and I wanted them in the Xbox port. So taking a look at the assets, I noticed that the movie files were there, but they were WMV files, which play fine in Windows, but on the original Xbox, a proprietary format known as XMV is utilized, which is not compatible. But this one wasn't difficult. I converted the WMVs to XMVs with the command line tool, updated the code to reference the XMVs, and surely enough, it worked. Now we have our movie files and cutscenes back in the game. The second problem, however, was even bigger, memory. The original Xbox only has 64 megabytes. I know this only too well. On the second level of the game, many of the textures and models failed to load. The first things I checked for was to see if they were properly located in the right folder, and they were. When I debugged why the Direct3D load texture calls were failing, it was because it was out of memory space. As you can see, the main character model is missing and the shots fired are white. This would not do. All textures in the game are 24-bit bitmap images and looking at the number and size of these files, it's easy to see how this can easily use up all the total RAM and fail. This issue was a showstopper. I didn't feel like it was release worthy if I couldn't resolve this one. I spent a few nights trying some things, even considered implementing virtual memory, but sometimes you need to keep things simple. So I decided to use some old school release group tricks that were used back in the day to rip DVD games and fit them on CD. Compression. For level 2 only, I converted and compressed all the bitmap graphics it uses down to JPEGs. This was a little more complicated, however. The mesh model files reference the bitmap textures too. So in the end, I compressed down the entire level data down to JPEGs, which saves a ton of memory space with only a slight decrease in clarity. On a CRT, the game looks amazing either way. I tested each of the 15 levels of the game and they all worked fine. After this, I did some minor cleanup of the UI to reposition some fonts and that's it. Some testing on a retail Xbox and it's done. The Xbox port plays great, nice and smooth 60 frames per second, and I wanted to make sure to add 480p progressive scan mode. I also wanted to implement 720p HD mode, but with the memory and resource issues very tight, I don't see it working without massive changes. I also did not want to stray the code too far away from the original vision and keep things the way that they were developed. 
So with that, I'm happy to announce with Tony's approval, the final unreleased version of the Xbox port of Freefall 3050 AD is now available to download for free. And it's in the link below on archive.org. So download it, play around with it. Let me know what you think about it. You can use a modded standard retail Xbox, has to be modded of course, in order to play the game. Now, as a bonus, if you have a modded Xbox 360, the backward compatibility on that will play the game as well. So enjoy it. Let me know what you think about it in the comments below. I had so much fun with this source code and I'm so happy to be able to release this game to you guys, to the fans of the Xbox. And if you like this video and you like the work that I've done, please consider purchasing the Steam game for $2.99 as a thank you to Tony for allowing me to take the source code and really just fix it up and get it ready for release in 2019. This was something that I had asked him to do as a favor. It really wasn't anything. There was no money that was exchanged. There was no, you know, contracts that were signed. It was just a fan reaching out to a developer with code that was unreleased and asking him if I could finish the game off for him, he agreed. So, you know, if you want to say thank you, the best way is to just hop on Steam, $2.99, and purchase a legitimate copy of the game and enjoy it. I'll leave a link to the Steam version below and really let Tony know in the reviews on Steam what you think of the game. Now, before I go, there are quite a few people that I want to thank for this video. I got a lot of help on the Nuance stuff. I don't have my own Nuance system, so I reached out to a bunch of people and they were very, very generous in, in helping me out with information and videos and screenshots and all sorts of different things. So first and foremost, I want to thank Kevin from the Nuon Dome who was very, very helpful. He ended up getting me some archive footage as well as some gameplay captures of some of the games that you saw previously in this video. I also want to say a big thank you to Austin at Gameplay and Talk. Check out his YouTube channel. I will leave a link in the description below. He is very, very knowledge with the new one. He did a live stream testing out all the games recently and he was very helpful as well, giving me captured footage of the Neon version of Freefall 3050 AD as well. So show him some love and hit him up with a sub. I'll leave a link to his channel in the comments below. And of course, I want to say a big thank you to Tony Takushi for agreeing to hand over the source code to some, some guy he never really even knew other than you know YouTube and, and stuff like that and entrusting me with the source code in order to get the game finished. I'm really happy that I was able to complete it for him and for you guys to enjoy the game free of charge. So let me know once again what you think of the game and this video in the comments below. I've rambled on long enough, but I've had a lot of fun putting this video together. It's been so much fun and stay tuned. There's so much more to come on this channel, guys. We're just scratching the surface of some of the homebrew stuff that I've been working on, as well as videos coming up in the you know third and fourth quarters of this year. There's so much cool stuff to come, so stick around. Well, guys, I'm going to leave it here for this video. Thank you so much for watching. If you liked it, you know what to do. Give me a thumbs up. And as always, don't forget to like and subscribe, and I'll catch you guys in the next video. Bye for now.